first, uh, the first two parts. And then we'll go into millennial scale viability and the last deglaciation. So we'll see how it goes and hopefully we'll cover everything. Um, so the first thing is how to reconstruct past climate. So we have different archives that we can use to try to understand what happened in the past. Uh, one of the first one and one that I really like is ice cores. So we'll look in a bit more details later. Um, ice cores are fantastic tools. Uh, and definitely one of the most used for glacial interglacial or millennial scale viability. But obviously, as you might think, they are a bit limited geographically. So one of the other um, archives that has been used, I guess, is actually the most widely used archive, and the oldest one is marine sediment core. So you go in the middle, not really in the middle of the ocean, but on the continental shelves, and you try to get a core of sediments and you analyze it, and again, we'll, we'll look into it in more detail. And a last one I just wanted to just show you, but I'm not going to talk about it today, are speleothems and corals. And actually, it's very funny, as I put out this, this lecture, I thought, you know, how similar they are. So here you have speleothems, and here you have a coral head. And they are both made of uh, calcium carbonate, but obviously come from very different environments. And so this is kind of a scanning, um, scanning of a coral head and scanning of a speleothem, and you can see the different colors, which, which are, uh, come about from different environments. So in, in, in corals, for example, here, you can see the different color uh, depending on the season, okay? So corals and speleothems are, are fantastic archives because they're very high-resolution archives. So in corals, you can see a seasonal cycle, almost. Speleothems, you can see maybe annual uh, changes. But they obviously have a limitation. One limitation is uh, geography. Obviously, with corals, they're going to be limited to the tropical, uh, tropical bands. And speleothems come only from karst region, which are, I mean, there are quite a few karst regions on Earth, but still it's limited. And one of other big problems of those two, uh, two archives is that um, they're kind of sporadic. So, for example, a, a coral is going to live maybe at most 200 years. So you can have very high resolution, seasonal resolution for 200 years. But then you don't know what happened before or after. So there are a lot of coral records for the last millennium or the last 2,000 years. You can still find some for all the older period of time, but obviously it's, it's kind of a challenge. So you find an old coral, you have to date it, figure out which, when did it grow, and then analyze it, and you have very high resolution for a short period of time, so you need many, many corals to try to infer something. Right? Speleothem is a bit of the same problem. You would go in a cave, find a speleothem, date it, and then it will come out from whatever age it is but it will leave most, most of the speleothems last a few thousand years, so they are longer. But then again, it's very hard to have a continuous record over a long period of time. So this to, just to give you a brief overview of the advantage and limitation of each of the, the archive. But I wanted to spend a bit more time on marine sediments uh, because they are the most widely used and obviously as the earth is mostly covered with ocean, that's where you're going to have the, the, most, um, uh, uh, the best coverage of, of, the, of the world, basically. And it's one of the first archive, I think, that has been used. So you have marine sediment cores from, like, the 60s, I think. So it's very... So people have been using this core for a long, long, long time. So you go on the continental shelf, you take a core, and a lot of time it just looks like this, mud, uh, on top, you have the most recent, so the youngest uh, part, usually um, contemporary. And at the bottom, you have the oldest, um, the oldest age. So first, you, you're going to try and do an age model. So you're going to try to get, so for the last 40,000 years, we're using uh, carbon-14 to date the cores. So it's a very uh, complicated process sometimes to make a good age model. And then, so here I'm going to detail you one of the most widely used methods, which is you, 
you cut down your core in like maybe centimeter slice, you take that mud, kind of wash it off, and then try to pick out here the creatures that are small zooplankton, they're foraminifera, and they're made out of calcium carbonate. And, and those creatures, there are many, many of them over most of the ocean, even though you will have trouble finding them in the Southern Ocean, for example, or at very um, high latitude. Um, and they live, so you have kind of two forms, you have the planktic and the benthic. Planktic meaning that they live at the surface of the ocean, and you have the benthic, which lives just above uh, the sediment layer. So within the same core, you can try to pick out those creatures for both the surface and the bottom, which will give you an indication of both conditions at the same time, right? And so there are several things you can measure as it's calcium carbonate. The first one that they use is uh, the oxygen isotopic composition of the calcite. So you try to uh, figure out the ratio of the heavy oxygen isotope, 18, over the most common oxygen isotope, 16. And this ratio will give you an indication of both the ocean temperature changes and the change in seawater delta O18. So the oxygen isotopic composition of seawater can be influenced by several processes, but basically is a hydrological cycle. <coughs> so rain versus um, evaporation, or also may maybe melting of the ice sheet. And one of the actually most used, um, so, so this proxy has been most used to infer changes in ice volume, so change in uh, continental ice sheet. And you'll see later they have varied uh, a lot over glacial and interglacial cycles. So another way you can try to get more information out of this is in the same creature you can use magnesium or calcium, which will give you an indication of change in ocean temperature. So maybe if you have both magnesium over calcium and delta O18, you can infer change in seawater uh, more robustly. You can also measure boron over calcium, which will give you an indication of the seawater chemistry. And one of the very uh, first measure as well is the carbon isotopic composition of the calcite. So basically, the reason is you could use, like you could get this measure, delta O18 and delta C13 at the same time on the same machine. So that's why they measured it. I mean, you can see uh, calcium carbonate is mostly um, composed of carbon and oxygen. So that was the, the, the rationale behind, I guess. And this is actually, it's a very complex proxy, carbon 13, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but basically if you measure it in the Bantic, uh, uh, for aminifera, so the one that live, you know, kind of deep in the water column, uh, that can give you an indication of change in oceanic circulation over time. So that's, that's what it is. So just, just to finish up on the marine sediments, um, I just want to give you an indication of, uh, of its use and limitation. So I guess one of its most obvious limitation is uh, sedimentation rate. So basically in order to be able to find those creatures or measure something useful in the marine sediment, you need a significant sedimentation rate, meaning you need productivity at the surface and going down into the sediment. Okay, if you have, for example, if you go into the gyres here or here, you have very little productivity, you also have a, 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 it's very deep and therefore you have not much sediment. So here you see sickness in meters of sediments, you almost have nothing. So basically in all those very dark blue areas, you can be sure you cannot get any interesting information. So basically all of information is limited to the continental shells here, mostly the green, okay, so very close to the continent with vast areas, and actually you see here the Pacific is completely cut. That's really what it means. It means that there's almost nothing, no information on what happened in the middle of the Pacific. And also, as we, um, we discussed, you take the foraminifera from the surface and the benthic that live uh, just above the sediment, meaning that if you go to very deep areas, maybe you know, more than 3,000 meters, you're gonna get information about the surface and about maybe 3,000 meter depths, but you will have no information about what happens in between, okay? 
but this uh, the marine sediment corals are fantastic because if you go maybe to low sedimentation rate area, you can get information over here, let's say the last 60 million years. So they are about coarse resolution, but you can easily get 20,000 years, many cores spanning the last interglacial, so 150,000 years, and some cores going back to a million or more. And this is a continuous record which can give you, you know, changes over time um, in a very nice manner. Okay. And <clears throat> now I just want to introduce you quickly the ice core records. So here focusing mostly on the most important one, which are uh, Greenland and Antarctica. So they've been both called uh, many times at different places. The oldest ice we have right now from Greenland is about 130,000 years. And it comes from Nîmes, which actually is not even on that map. It's a new core. With the oldest core and grip and grip stopping at about 90,000 years. So this is the oldest ice we have from Greenland. In Antarctica, you have ice going back to about a million years. Um, so this is from Dome C here. So you can get a million years because uh, the accumulation rate is fairly low. But of course, if you have a low accumulation rate, means you have low resolution. But they also have other cores, so closer here to, for example, the Rossi, where you have maybe high accumulation rate. So you're looking at more um, shorter period in time but with much more accumulation. And so those cores um, are fantastic because just like in marine sediment core, you would analyze the snow. So snow is just H2O. So you're looking at the oxygen <coughs> isotopic composition of the snow and also the deuterium, so the heavy <coughs> hydrogen over the light hydrogen. And this will give you information about temperature changes mostly, or the source of precipitation. But ice cores are also fantastic because when, so this is when you, you are actually forming an ice core. So here we have snow falling down. And as the snow falls down, it gets compacted. And when it gets compacted and transformed into what we call fern, you have bubble of air that are trapped in the ice matrix. And so if you go down here and you analyze uh, a core from the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, you'll find those bubbles of air, which actually represent uh, the atmospheric uh, composition of the time. So you can infer change in <coughs> atmospheric gases. So obviously the one we are most interested in, carbon dioxide, but also methane, etc. There are issues with this, meaning that the age of the air bubble here at a point in time are going to be different from the age of the ice they are in. So there's a bit of a challenge in, in again, finding a good um, age model. But this is a fantastic tool, and I'm going to show it a lot here. OK. And uh, just very quickly, what we can also use are Earth system models, coupled Earth system models, of course, right? So if we have all this information, we can also use a couple model and just force a model with change in incoming solar radiation or maybe change in <coughs> carbon dioxide if we know it or change in ice sheet and let the model run and we can study the dynamics, the teleconnection, etc. So paleoclimate modeling is very important also right? and can help us understand a lot of past climates and I will show you a, a bit I guess in this talk. Okay, so now let's move on to a glacial interglacial cycle. So I would hope that most of you know what it is. But basically here we are looking at ice core records. So this is Epical Dome C in Antarctica over the last 500,000 years. And here we see change in temperature. Okay, so you see what we call here glacial interglacial cycle, warm temperature here, so interglacial a slow glacial inception and a long glacial period of about 100,000 years cumulate here ending up with uh, what we call a last glacial maximum and then a very short deglaciation. So glacial interglacial cycles characterized by what we call long glacial period and fairly short interglacial warm periods. Okay. And again, coming from the same core, we can infer changes in atmospheric CO2. 
and fantastically we can see that both Antarctic temperature and atmospheric CO2 vary in phase over here the last 500,000 years but you can go back to about a million years and you will see both of them varying nicely in phase. So warm period you have about 280 ppm of atmospheric CO2 and as atmospheric goes down we have also temp at Antarctic temperature going down and as a glass glacier maximum about 180 ppm of CO2 and a very fast deglaciation. So people have been studying um, a lot the glacial interglacial cycle <coughs> to try to understand the dynamics or, or the causes of it. And so we're going to look into them. So one of the main what we call external forcing of these glacial interglacial cycles are change in insulation. So, oh, sorry, I wanted to show you here, of course, where we are here today, 400 ppm in a very short period of time. So well out of the range of the million years change in atmospheric CO2. So change in um, incoming solar radiation. So this is the Earth here as it rotates around the sun. And uh, Earth's rotation around the sun is not constant. It varies in time significantly. And it has kind of three components. And this is called uh, the Milankovitch cycles. So we look into these three components. First one is eccentricity with a period of 100,000 years which is just basically how circular is the rotation of the Earth around the Sun. And this will modulate the total amount of incoming solar radiation. So if you go back to this, that's why people have, have hypothesized that the eccentricity, which has a 100,000 year cyclicity, should be a main driver of glacial interglacial cycle because it has the same cyclicity of about 100,000 years. <clears throat> but you will see that this is, this is not enough, but this is one of the main components. One of the other uh, components of, of the Earth's orbit around the Sun is what we call obliquity with a 41,000 year uh, periodicity, which is basically the tilt of the Earth, which varies in between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees, and apparently that has a lot, it's very important. Uh, just because with high obliquity, the high latitude solar radiation increases in summer. So it's more like it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't change the total amount of radiation that reaches but it changes the latitudinal distribution of solar radiation. Okay? And the last one is precession with a periodicity of about 26,000 years, which is the wobble of, of the Earth. And again, this will affect the distribution, not the total amount, of uh, radiation, but it affects the intensity of the season, therefore the hemispheric distribution uh, of solar radiation. So for example, uh, if the southern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun in summer, it will receive more incoming solar radiation. Okay? So this uh, Milankovitch cycle uh, have been hypothesized to be one of the major drivers of glacial interglacial uh, cycles. But once you put that in a model, let's say if you have your three dimensional Earth system model and you make it, you force this model with change in solar radiation, you can have a bit of a glacial interglacial cycle, but it'd be very, very muted. In fact, the changes in solar radiation are fairly small. I cannot explain the, the amplitude of those glacial interglacial cycles. So one other um, mechanism is going to involve uh, ice sheet extent and topography. So here we go back. So sorry, the time now has changed. But here we have 500,000 years ago, going back in time this way. Here we have present. And again, we see CO2 varying by 180 ppm to 280. Antarctic temperature here, and here we have ice volume as inferred actually from benthic uh, oxygen isotopic composition. Okay, and you see that when you are in a glacial state, you have very large ice sheet over the northern hemisphere, so very low sea level, a sea level of about 120 meters lower. And this is the ice sheet that was covering up the northern hemisphere at the last glacial maximum, so 21,000 years ago. 
you had a very large ice sheet over all of North America, so going down into the United States here, into the Great Lakes, obviously all over Greenland, and also over the Fennoscandian and a bit of European ice sheet. So this uh, large ice sheet, in fact, also has in, an impact on climate through the albedo. You all, I'm sure all know the albedo effect, but basically here you kind of uh, go from um, a low albedo, maybe forest, to a very high albedo uh, ice sheet, and therefore this has, this is just a positive feedback, further cooling uh, the northern hemisphere and cooling the system. So we know this is a very important part. And of course, um, the other part is atmospheric CO2. So this is where it comes a bit of a chicken and egg issue, is that we know that change in atmospheric CO2 are one of the major drivers of glacial interglacial change, but we still don't know why atmospheric CO2 is is, is varying so much during glacial interglacial cycles. So we have ideas and we're going to look into them or to why atmospheric CO2 is working. But basically, this is one of the main positive feedback of the Earth system. So you have one external forcing, insulation, and two very strong positive feedback, the ice sheet extent and atmospheric CO2. So just to give you an idea of the complexity of the atmospheric CO2 system, basically, um, you know, we would all like to say, okay, it's getting colder, as it's getting colder, the solubility of atmospheric CO2 in the ocean increases, and therefore you decrease atmospheric CO2, end of story. Uh, but we know that this is not enough, and in fact, the change in atmospheric CO2 and glacial interglacial cycles are due to a multitude of factors, and we have an idea about all the factors that potentially have an impact, but basically we haven't been able to simulate successfully glacial interglacial change in atmospheric CO2, meaning that we still think there are problems uh, with our understanding of the carbon cycle right now. So basically the hypothesis or what, what we think our best estimates right now are of course, temperature, <coughs> so you get colder, and I'll show it to you later. Get colder, you get more, more CO2 dissolved in the ocean, you lower PCO2. But this is maybe 25 ppm. Problem is, as you build your ice sheet on land, you're going to increase the salinity of the ocean, and this has a reverse effect. So basically, solubility, you have a positive effect from temperature, but a negative effect from salinity. Um, ocean circulation could potentially help in driving atmospheric CO2. Uh, iron fertilization, so those are uh, processes that we'll just talk in, in a bit more detail in a second. Also, other processes that have been put forward, so change in remineralization rate. So basically, uh, you have primary productivity at the surface <coughs> of the ocean. Then you export some of this organic matter down in the column. This organic matter gets remineralized, okay, and basically the nutrients kind of go back to the surface. So this is not an efficient way of transporting carbon <coughs> to the deep ocean, if, if that's what you want to decrease atmospheric CO2. And remineralization rate is oftentimes <coughs> done uh, or mediated by bacteria and the hypothesis is that if you're in a colder ocean, maybe bacteria have more, uh, the remineralization rate is going to be slower, meaning you can potentially bring more organic matter to the deep ocean. So that could uh, lower um, atmospheric CO2. So just quickly on solubility in more detail. So you all know that um, the solubility of carbon dioxide in the water is going to be dependent on temperature uh, and salinity, mostly, and the uh, atmospheric composition, obviously. So if you have low temperature and low salinity is when you can have the most uh, atmospheric CO2 uh, soluble in the ocean. Uh, so, as we said, during glacial time with very cold temperatures, this increased solubility, 
but as we have uh, increased um, ashit over the continents, we have a lower sea level, about 120 meters, which should increase the global salinity by about 1 PSU, which <coughs> means that you have less solubility of CO2. So at the end, we think that combined effect of temperature and salinity is about 10 ppm, so very far from the or target of about 80 to 100 ppm for glacial interglacial CO2. One of the major hypotheses for changes in atmospheric CO2 comes from iron fertilization. So basically here again we have the Antarctic temperature record over the whole glacial interglacial. So here's the last interglacial going down, last glacial maximum, and present day PCO2. <coughs> And here we have iron flux in the Antarctic ice core. And you can see that the iron flux is increasing a lot during glacial time. And this is uh, sea surface phosphate, for those of you who know, and uh, chlorophyll concentration basically gives you an idea of export production at the surface of the ocean. <coughs> and you see that some areas, so particularly the Southern Ocean, has very high content uh, a phosphate content on the surface. So if um, basically phytoplankton, uh, so I don't know who knows about biochemistry here, but basically if we have phytoplankton at the surface of the ocean, in order to <coughs> grow, they will need several things. They need light, they need maybe fairly good temperature, but they also need nutrients. And one of the ma major nutrients is phosphate. So you have phosphate and nitrate. Usually phosphate is known to limit um, primary production. So you would think that if you have phytoplankton here, they would be very happy. They would taking up all this phosphate and grow uh, very fast. But here that's not what's happening. We still have lots of phosphate at the surface and we have very low primary productivity, meaning that there's something else limiting uh, the production at the surface of the Southern Ocean, and we think it is iron. So iron can be a micronutrient. When you say iron flux, in which direction? Like flux from where to where? Oh, sorry. So if you go back here, this is in Antarctic ice core. You look at the iron flux, so deposit. So how much iron has been deposited over Antarctica? So this is mostly coming from Patagonia. So from Patagonia to Antarctica, but if you go from Patagonia to Antarctica, you have the Southern Ocean in between. So basically the hypothesis is that in glacial time, as Patagonia gets really dry, and potentially winds are changing as well, you could have higher deposition of iron over the Southern Ocean, which would fertilize the Southern Ocean, so increase the primary productivity, and if you increase primary productivity, so of course I didn't put it here, I assumed you all knew, but maybe not. Uh, so uh, phytoplankton do photosynthesis, so they use uh, phosphate and atmospheric CO2 to make organic matter, so organic carbon, which is then exported to the deep ocean. So if you increase uh, primary productivity, technically you're decreasing atmospheric CO2. In one way. So this would be a, a very uh, simple way to look into it. So if you increase iron fertilization, you increase primary productivity over the Southern Ocean, you increase your organic carbon exported to the deep, and you can lower atmospheric CO2. And maybe some of you know that they actually try to reproduce basically this experiment by going into the Southern Ocean, putting in a bunch of iron, and looking at what happens. So you do boost the, pri the primary productivity, but the question is how much, how, how, what is the effect of this natural iron fertilization on the carbon cycle and on atmospheric CO2? So there have been a lot of studies, and basically we, we come up with this number, which would be a 10 to 50, 15 ppm decrease in atmospheric CO2 over a glacial interglacial cycle. Um, there have been many studies, so we think it's more or less <coughs> robust, but maybe we're forgetting all the feedback in the system. This we don't know. And finally, another one I just want to quickly talk about, our change in ocean circulation. 
So uh, you all know here we have, this is the uh, Atlantic dissolved in organic carbon in the late Holocene, so kind of pre-industrial time. We have North Atlantic deep water flowing from the surface of the North Atlantic southward. Here we have Antarctic bottom water. Okay. An hypothesis would be that you would have a different oceanic circulation at the last glacial maximum. So potentially here a much shallower and weaker cell for the North Atlantic deep water and potentially a weaker Antarctic bottom water, which would mean you would have a more uh, stratified or less ventilated ocean, which would lead to a higher carbon content in the ocean. Okay, so this could be another maybe 15 ppm coming from changes in oceanic circulation. So just to say that um, changes in carbon dioxide over glacial interglacial cycle are still uh, research in progress. People still struggling to understand what happened, even though it seems like something we should really try to know because it involves all the components of the, the carbon cycle system. Okay. So do you have questions maybe on glacial interglacial cycle and atmospheric CO2? Just on that last slide, about the It's a big um, question, obviously, and not an easy one. Uh, one possibility, so this would be last glacial maximum, so not the whole time during the last glacial period, but you did have a very large ice sheet over uh, the northern hemisphere, so the lower Antarctic ice sheet in Greenland, which could have led to significant runoff over the North Atlantic, so that's one possibility. You could have also a different salinity distribution in the ocean, so it has been shown that the deep water may be very, very salty. So possibly, you know, you would have kind of a salinity stratification instead of having the temperature stratification. And also in the Southern Ocean, you have to take into account that, and I didn't talk about it, but the Antarctic ice sheet was also much larger, and it is supposed that uh, there was a glacier, so granted, uh, ice sheet on both the Ross and Weddell Sea, which are now um, major areas of Antarctic bottom water production. So you would have to displace your Antarctic bottom water formation to, uh, to the deep ocean, basically, to deep convection. And you also have a very large sea ice edge. So we don't know, but that's, that's why it's important, that's why it's interesting to study it, because if you study past climates, or, or let's say if you look into the future and look into today, you think you have an understanding of what's happening, and you think, okay, it's easy, we go to warm climate, it's going to be warm, it's going to be stratified, we, we understand what happened. And then you go back in the past, and you get clues from the archive and from the models and everything, and you try to understand what happened, and you see that you actually don't understand everything, <laughs> and there are much more questions uh, that, that arise. Ooh, yes. Um, I just wonder, do you have high enough um, temperature resolution to be able to figure out what the effect is first? So, is it if the glacier into glacier? Is it an albedo effect that occurs first, and the frequency of the glacier is the carbon effect that comes first? You mean in terms of magnitude or in terms of what happens? So, so basically. So basically, the, the uh, oh, you mean the lead and lag between temperature and CO2? That's what you're talking about. Well, I mean, there's all these, there's all these knock-on effects. Yeah. So that's still what we're trying to understand, basically, and that's where maybe models are really important. So, so basically, if you go back to the original study, people would have said it's insulation driving everything. Okay, and, and you just need changes in uh, insulation. But it, when you actually go into a model and, and force your model with changing insulation, you're going to see that this is not enough, right? So basically, 
you, you can run models with just insulation, with insulation and topography, with insulation topography and greenhouse gas and see what happens. That's one of the first things you do. And then you have several, uh, let's say, um, I mean, it, it's a combined study and we all, you know, if moving forward in, in the same direction, if you wish, with different, um, different tools, right? So you'll have people who will just focus on ice sheet reconstruction and ice sheet modeling to try to understand how you can build an ice sheet during the glacial inception, which is something people are still struggling with. You can look into the carbon cycle and temperature, lead and lag, and see what happened first. Did you first decrease temperature in some place? Or did you first decrease atmospheric CO2? What? So it be we're still struggling. I have to admit that this is, you know, uh, still something we're, we're still struggling with, particularly during the glacial inception. If we go to the deglaciation, the last deglaciation, maybe I'll go a bit more into it, then we have a better understanding because it was only 20,000 years ago and it was very rapid. And there, for example, uh, the hypothesis is that change in Antarctic temperature and CO2 occur at the same time, more or less. So sometimes there's some studies saying there's a 200 uh, year lead or lag or one another, but it's very difficult to, to pinpoint because you have these issues of uh, gas age, ice age difference in the same ice core for example. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's really an ongoing study, I would say. And we are, we, you could see some surprise coming up in the next 10 years. You don't know. Yeah. So that sort of warming and stratification, I always thought of that as a transient response to that, sure enough, warming over a few hundred years or maybe even a thousand years would lead to stratification. But once the system equilibrated in a warmer state, then it would actually, that would increase well, I mean, I don't know, but surely enough there are those, those issues of, well, I don't know if the climate system was ever or will ever be in an equilibrium state, but you obviously have transient changes that can be very different to the end product, and it depends on the time scale you're looking at. Obviously here we're looking at very long time scale. And for future change, they're looking at just a few hundred yeah. years or sometimes decadal, which, and you're right, can be very different. Okay. Maybe let's move on to the interglacial. Um, okay, so I just wanted to uh, very briefly talk about interglacials. Interglacials are obviously very important and now becoming one of the major area of studies because they are a future analog, maybe, or or the best analog to future climate, we think. So here we are here in our current interglacial. So here, for example, Antarctic temperature, fairly warm, high atmospheric CO2. Uh, so this is still pre-industrial, obviously. We don't have the 400 ppm we are in right now. This is just natural climate viability and high sea level. And we can go back to the last interglacial which was about 120,000 years ago, MIS-5, with, again, high temperature, high CO2, high sea level. And we have MIS-7 here, fairly short, 9 and 11. So the two interglaciers that are the most of interest are here, this one, MIS-5 and MIS-11. And I will tell you uh, quickly uh, why. Basically, here we are present day. This is our sea level, our CO2, which went from 280 to 400, and a temperature related to pre-industrial right now about one degree. But if you go back to, ex in fact, the last interglacial, MIS-5E, 125,000 years ago, you'll see something very interesting or scary, is that the sea level was actually higher than today. It was six to nine meter higher than today. And the temperature, actually here they say only one degree, but I'll show you a slide later where they say maybe two degrees warmer than today. And MIS-11 here, 400,000 years ago, again, a sea level six to 13 meter higher and warmer temperatures than pre-industrial. And you can see that CO2 was maybe 300 ppm, okay? So there were uh, changes in the climate systems that made that those interglacial were actually much warmer, and we think it's insulation. So there was a different insulation, higher insulation during that time, 
which led to higher sea level and warmer temperature. So for example here again if we look at a snapshot at 125,000 years ago, so this is an estimate of sea surface temperature from different, um, different proxy, uh, red meaning warmer temperature and blue meaning cooler temperature and you can see areas, so particularly the North Atlantic here, the Northwest Coast, and maybe the Southern Ocean displaying much warmer temperature. And they suggest in this paper that it was globally, uh, the sea surface was globally 2.5 degrees warmer than pre-industrial. And what happened to our ice sheet is actually very scary is that here, so you're zooming into the last interglacial, so 130 to 110,000 uh, years ago. Uh, as I said, we had maybe sea level six to nine meter higher. So this is a simulation they made with a, a high resolution ice sheet model over Antarctica, but also constrained by observation. And they find, so basically this is two possibility of the maximum ice sheet retreat over Antarctica at about, let's say, so we are here, hundred, let's say 125,000 years ago. So you see that the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is marine-based, uh, which is under sea level today, uh, is just almost completely gone. Okay, so this is a very scary uh, look into the future. And this is also why it's very important to study interglacials or past climate to try to understand what happened and how you were able to lose most of the Antarctic ice sheet and a large part of the Greenland ice sheet, whereas the CO2 was lower than it is today. Okay. And here we're just going to make a short pause. Oh, so Neri Lee was supposed to give this lecture and she made a very nice... Uh, little video and she said we should look at Carbon dioxide is one of the main gases in our atmosphere that traps heat, creating the greenhouse effect that provides the conditions that allow human life to exist on Earth. Without the natural greenhouse effect, the average temperature on Earth would be a frigid minus 18 degrees Celsius. And we know from the geological record that natural changes in carbon dioxide levels have directly related to past increases and decreases in global temperatures. Scientists use ice core records from Antarctica to reconstruct prehistoric temperature records. And those same ice layers trap little bubbles of CO2, which means we can see how they relate over time. Temperature and CO2 have fluctuated together through ice ages and warm periods called interglacials. Slow changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun initiated the ice ages. CO2 was a natural amplifier, causing the global climate to warm and cool through each cycle. Here, at about 200 to 300,000 years ago, is where modern humans had just evolved. And here, at the last interglacial period, the sea level peaked at about 6 to 9 metres higher than it is today. At about 20,000 years ago, we have the last ice age. At that time, kilometre thick ice sheets spread across Europe and North America, eating up water and driving sea levels down to 130 metres lower than where we are today. From that low, cold point, the CO2 rises naturally by as much as 35 parts per million each 1,000 years, stabilising to near modern levels at around 10,000 years ago. Oh look, there's the birth of modern agriculture, and the wheel, and the pyramids in Egypt. And now we hit the common era, the year zero CE. At this point, the world population is just 200 million people. And here's where scientists first demonstrate the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide, way back in 1861. It would take until 1938 for scientists to show the Earth was warming and propose that CO2 was the cause. Here's where we are now. When the Earth warmed out of the last ice age, CO2 levels naturally increased by 35 parts per million over 1,000 years. Humans have caused CO2 to rise by this amount in just the last 17 years. And our population is at 7.5 billion people, with many cities around the world rapidly developing, 
increasing their CO2 output year on year. Our current temperature is about one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This might not sound like much, but the last time our climate was that warm was the last interglacial period when sea levels were six to nine metres higher, enough to creep into cities like New York, Manila, Brisbane, and flood Bangkok, Miami, Amsterdam, and many more. On current projections, by 2100, our climate could warm by four degrees Celsius or even more, depending on our actions to cut CO2 levels. So, does this look natural to you? Uh, yeah, so quickly, uh, we're going to move on <laughs> because we've gone through uh, just the first two parts. So uh, we discussed with Melissa, I'm just going to go quickly, just show you the iron reshevance and then I'll stop there. Uh, but basically here we're just zooming on the last 60,000 years. So here, the last glacial period, the last glacial maximum, the glaciation, and to present day. So this is uh, Greenland uh, Delta O18, um, uh, so Delta O18 record from Greenland ice core, showing you changes in temperature. And there's something very striking in this, in this figure, is the millennial <coughs> scale variabilities that you see in Greenland over the last glacial period. So you see variation of about 8 degrees Celsius in less than 100 years. And this is about half of a full glacial interglacial cycle in Greenland. So it's been a, a, a lot of study trying to figure out why this happened and what were the consequences on the climate and the carbon cycle. So this is uh, basically what we call the Dashgar, Erschke, and Heinrich variability. And so if we look into what we call Heinrich event, which is some of the most pronounced of this, uh, these events, so we are in a glacial time with a very large ice sheet over North America, like this. And it is hypothesized that during some period of time, you start to have an ice shelf collapse, which can lead then to uh, an abrupt discharge of meltwater into the North Atlantic. So if you add meltwater to the North Atlantic, you decrease the salinity tremendously, and you all know that North Atlantic deep water is formed right there in the North Atlantic Ocean. So very dense water sink to the bottom, flow southward over in, in the deep Atlantic, okay, and drive uh, the oceanic circulation. So it is very uh, wrong plot. But basically, it is hypothesized that you would have a warm state here with very strong North Atlantic deep water formation and interstadial and suddenly you will start to have melting of the ice shelf and the ice sheet. So it has been described as an armada of iceberg going into the North Atlantic and melting away. So you start to decrease uh, the density of the surface water in the North Atlantic and weaken your North Atlantic deep water formation. So you will slowly go down here into a stadial and finally, you would finish by an Heinrich event where you would maybe totally uh, shut down the formation of North Atlantic deep water in, and go into a very cold state. Uh, so we tested that some time ago where we took an uh, Earth system model and we just added fresh water to the North Atlantic and we can or shut down here North Atlantic deep water formation. So the model is in blue, and here's a proxy for uh, the overturning in the North Atlantic. And each time you shut down or weaken the North Atlantic deep water formation, you cool Greenland by maybe 8 degrees Celsius, and you cool the surface of the North Atlantic. So this is the Iberian margin by about 3 degrees Celsius in, in good agreement with proxy record. So basically, if, if you look a bit closely at this mechanism, uh, what happens is that you here weaken or shut down your formation of North Atlantic deep water. And as you do that, you decrease your meridional heat transport to the North Atlantic. So you all know about the Gulf Stream, for example, this very warm current warming up the uh, warm western boundary current, warming the 
uh, England and uh, Northern Europe. So this will weaken significantly. You weaken your marginal transport, you cool all of the North Atlantic. Here we have a decrease in SST of maybe three to four degrees, a strong advance in your sea ice, cooling